The Psychic Adventures of Derek Okora Read by the author As a small child, I lived with my mother and my elder brother and sister at the home of my grandmother in Bootle, Liverpool. My father worked as a merchant seaman and was home for only very short periods of time. Grand's was a large three-storey Victorian house on Brasenose Road, close to the then thriving port of Liverpool. After school each day, we three children were sent up to the top floor to play whilst our evening meal was being prepared. My first experience of spirit occurred one day just after Gran had called Colin, Barbara and me down for our tea. Being the youngest of three, and with much the shortest legs, I was always the last to arrive downstairs. On this particular day, as I reached the first landing of the staircase, I saw a man I didn't recognise. Hello, young Ty, he said as he reached out towards me. It felt as though I had ruffled my hair. I was afraid because I thought there was a stranger in Gran's house. Never had I reached the bottom of the stairs more quickly. I ran panting into the kitchen, shouting to Gran and my mother that there was a strange man in the house. My grandmother and my mother hurried up the stairs, only to return a few moments later with bemused expressions on their faces. Tell me what the man looked like, Gran said. On hearing my description, she reached for a tin in which old family photographs were kept. She took out a photograph and showed it to me. That's him, I shouted. That's the man on the stairs. Gran looked at my mother and said, He's the next. Derek will be the next person in the family to work for spirit. I looked from my grandmother to my mother, not understanding what they were talking about. Gran gently explained to me that the man I had seen on the stairs was not in fact a stranger, but my grandfather, who had passed to the world of spirit as a result of an accident three years before I was born. In time, when you're older, Derek, she said, you will see many people who have passed on to the next life. You will work with people in the spirit world and will help many people on your life's pathway. I soon put all this to the back of my mind, but occasionally over the next few years I would question my grandmother about this world of spirit. Each time she would explain to me that it was my destiny to work with the spirit people one day. But I want to be a footballer, I would tell her. Gran would smile knowingly. All she would say was, we'll see. At the age of 13, I began to realise my dream when I signed as a schoolboy player with Wrexham Football Club. I lived, ate and breathed football. My bedfellow was not a teddy bear, but a football, which I clutched to my chest as I fell asleep and dreamed of scoring goals for England. At the age of 15, I signed as an apprentice pro with Liverpool Football Club under the management of the great Bill Shankly. But sadly, I didn't quite make the grades as a first-team player. After four years, I moved back to Wrexham FC, then to Glentoran Football Club of Northern Ireland. It was at this time that I met my first wife, Joan. After a season with Glentoran, I joined Stockport County FC, but didn't feel particularly happy with my footballing career. Joan had just given birth to our son, Carl, when I was asked whether I would be interested in playing football abroad. The idea appealed to me, and after a lengthy discussion with Joan, I agreed. We were Australia bound. I joined USC Lion of the South Australian Football League. Unfortunately, although I was very happy living in Australia, Joan was not. She missed her friends and her family back home. The physical rigours of the game were also beginning to take their toll on me. Ultimately, we made the decision to return to England. By 1982, my footballing days were over. Throughout my career as a professional footballer, I had not lost my interest in the world of spirit. There had been many instances when spirit people had made their presence felt and impressed upon me proof of survival after this earthly life. With my return to English shores came the time for me to start working for spirit. Sadly, my marriage to Joan had come to an end. Now living on my own, I began to do private readings for people in my home but soon the demand became so great that I had to find office space. Although I was working as a full-time spirit medium, 
I had not yet developed the gift of clairaudience. This was about to change. Ever since my grandmother's realisation that I was the one who had inherited her mediumistic gifts, she had gently tutored me and explained to me the workings of the spirit world. She taught me that we all have spirit guides and that I was no exception. Throughout my lifetime, many guides would come and go, she explained, but my main guide was a black man from the Ethiopian regions of Africa and he would never leave me. One day he would introduce himself to me. One evening I was at home alone. I had just completed my evening meditation and was sitting listening to some music. Suddenly I heard a voice saying, Hello Derek. This was repeated four times. Then the voice said, I'm Sam. Even though I was perfectly well aware that I was alone, I looked around, expecting to see somebody. There was nobody there. Realisation dawned. At last my spirit guide had spoken to me. The words my grandmother had uttered all those years ago had come true. It was during these early days that I met my second wife, Gwen, who had herself been through the sadness of a marriage breakup. I knew immediately upon meeting her that she was somebody who would understand me. We had a bond which remains unbroken to this day. We moved to a home just outside Southport on Merseyside, and as well as my private readings, I began to work as a regular guest on a number of radio stations. I was driving through to Liverpool one day when my mobile phone rang. It was Gwen ringing to tell me that the Grenada Breeze television programme, Live Time, had been in touch to ask whether I'd be interested in making a guest appearance. This was the first time that I'd been offered a spot on a television programme. Nervously, I agreed. The following Friday, I arrived at the Manchester studios and was introduced to the presenter of Lifetime, Becky Want. Hi, Derek, she said. Now, what we're looking for is somebody who can read tea leaves. Tea leaves? It was National Tea Week. I was nervous. I had not conducted a reading using this method before, but as the introductory music began, Sam told me to relax and that everything would be fine and that he wouldn't let me down. The time passed quickly. I conducted Becky's reading successfully and before I knew it, she was thanking me and telling me what I had told her was correct. The closing music was playing and it was the end of the programme. That was wonderful, Derek, Becky said. On the Wednesday of the following week, I received another telephone call from Grenada Breeze. The public response to my initial appearance had been so great that the producer thought it would be a good idea if I was to appear weekly. I was delighted to accept. So began my career as a television psychic. Since that day, I have had many adventures. Recently, I've been catapulted into the public eye on a much grander scale and all thanks to Carl Beatty and Yvette Fielding, who invited me to take part in Living TV's celebrated Most Haunted programme. It is almost three years now since the pilot programme was filmed, and we are preparing to shoot the fourth and the fifth series. Now I find that I am communing with spirits from different eras, different backgrounds, and different cultures. I have taken a journey into the history of my homeland, something which I sadly neglected to do during my school days. For the first time in my life, I've been frightened. For the first time, I've sometimes been perplexed at the workings of spirit. What I have not lost, however, is my faith. The spirits have never let me down. Here, I've attempted to give an insight into my experiences whilst travelling the country, both on the stage and in front of television cameras. I hope that you will enjoy making that journey with me. First Steps Once I had met Sam again, my work for Spirit increased. My first experience of stepping up onto the platform in a spiritualist church was a particularly memorable one. Gwen and I had driven to Blackpool. It was a hot, sunny day, and as we headed out of the seaside town, we heard on the car radio that the motorways were terribly congested. 
so we decided that we would delay our departure in order to miss the heavy traffic. To while away a couple of hours, we thought we would take a trip further up the coast to Lancaster. We arrived in the old town around half an hour later. By now it had started to rain, so our original idea of taking a walk around the town did not seem nearly so appealing. I drove around looking for a parking space and found one in a narrow side street. As we sat wondering what to do next to kill the time, I happened to look through the rear view mirror and saw a small building behind me. Over the door were the words, Lancaster Spiritualist Church. I got out of the car, walked over to the notice board and saw that the service would be commencing in 15 minutes. We attended the Spiritualist Church in Liverpool regularly, but I thought it would be nice to join the service in Lancaster. When agreed. We walked through the door and squeezed into a couple of seats at the rear of the hall. It was very small, with a capacity of no more than 50 people. The presiding medium for that day was a lady named Gloria Duthie. I had heard of Gloria, but had never seen her work. The service began with the usual prayers, hymns and dedications before the medium took the platform. Two or three messages had been passed on from loved ones to the members of the congregation, when suddenly Gloria pointed to the back of the hall and said, I've a man here. He's a very brushed Scot, and he wants to speak to Derek. Gwen dug me in the ribs with her elbow. But as I have no Scottish links in my family, and as Derek is not the most uncommon name, I remain silent. I know I'm going to someone at the back of the hall with this man, Gloria said. I want the Derek who is linked to football. This spirit man is telling me to tell Derek that the boss is here and he's still putting the goals in the onion bag over there. Now I knew that message could only be for me. The boss was most definitely my old boss from my footballing days at Liverpool Football Club, the legendary Bill Shankly. He was the only person I knew who referred to the goal net as the onion bag and it would be far too much of a coincidence to have two Derricks in such a small congregation who both had links with football and the great man. I put my hand up. Thank you, Derek, Gloria said. This man is telling me that you shouldn't worry about not making it to the top in football. He tells me that you'll make your mark in another way. Working for spirit. He's saying that you must never give up. That you must continue on no matter what obstacles are put in your way, because you are meant to do this work. He's telling me that you should be up on this platform, conducting the service. He tells me that I'm good, but you'll be better. He's laughing and saying, just tell him it's shanks. Gloria continued with messages from my grandmother Helen, from my uncle George, and a family friend called Mickey. She told me that one day, my name would be in lights, and that I would work for Spirit in all parts of the world, and finished by asking me if she could talk to me after the service. When the final prayers and hymns had been completed, and the absent healing requests read out, I waited at the back of the hall to speak to Gloria. She was a lovely lady, and congratulated me on the work that I was to do for Spirit. After a few minutes, the booking secretary for the church approached us. I'd like to book you to conduct next week's service here, she said. Me? I was overwhelmed. Although I had spent many years as a member of the spiritualist congregation, I had never taken a platform before. Gwen was busily digging me in the ribs. She had always said that I should have more confidence in myself. I reluctantly agreed. For the whole of the following week, I was extremely nervous. Finally, the day arrived. We set out to travel along the M6, but as we were nearing the service station at Charnock Richard, the car began to overheat. We pulled onto the forecourt and checked the radiator. Although there was no sign of a leak, there was very little water in it. I think we'd better telephone the church and tell them that I won't be able to make it, I said to Gwen. No way, she replied. You've said that you'll take the service and you'll do just that, even if I have to push you there in the car. We filled a couple of bottles of water and set off once more. We had to stop twice to let the engine cool and to top up the radiator, 
but eventually we arrived in Lancaster and parked in front of the church. As I walked through the door, my stomach was rolling and I was feeling terribly nervous. The walk to the podium seemed endless as I tottered along on quaking legs. Then the prayers were said and the hymns were sung, and before I knew it, it was time for my demonstration of mediumship. Please don't let me down, I begged Sam. Don't worry, Derry, this is your destiny, Sam replied. And I need not have worried. After a faltering start, the messages began to flow. I saw spirit people and I heard spirit people, and they all passed on messages of love to the family members sitting in the congregation. I found I was really enjoying myself. Before I knew it, I was being called to time by the president of the church. I received a round of applause and my heart swelled with gratitude. As I stood there on that tiny platform in one of the smallest churches I have ever been in, I knew that I had been foolish to question the spirit. Those on the other side knew that I was ready to undertake platform work, but I had doubted it. Thank goodness that Gwen had an unswerving faith in my mediumistic abilities and had urged me to do just what Shanks had told me, to carry on no matter what obstacles were put in my way. Over the following years, I travelled the country appearing in spiritualist churches in different towns. Although I very much enjoyed this, it frustrated me that so few people were attending the churches. In those days, the hard and fast belief was that normal people just did not go there, only people who wanted to talk to the dead. I realised that it was time the spiritualism took a step forward into the present day and become more people-friendly. I knew that the great Doris Stokes and one or two of the better-known mediums in the UK had appeared in theatres. What would happen, I thought, if I did something similar? With this idea in mind, I contacted one or two cabaret clubs in the Liverpool area to see whether they would be interested in hiring out their premises to me for an evening of clairvoyance. Unsurprisingly, I received a number of point-blank refusals, but eventually I received a positive response from the manager of the Oral Park Ballroom. A month or so later, I was waiting backstage to be announced to an audience of 250 or more people. This is the way it's meant to be. I thought to myself, if I am to be working for Spirit, surely it's part of my job to ensure that I spread the knowledge to as many people as possible. Over the next year or two, I appeared at civic halls and small theatres. Audiences were growing and were no longer comprised exclusively of women. Other mediums were also following in my footsteps. The word of Spirit was definitely being spoken to a wider audience. Time moved on and eventually I was spreading the word, not just in theatres, but also on television with Psychic Lifetime. One day I was summoned to the office and told that because of the popularity of Psychic Lifetime, it had been decided to create a new programme, which was to be named Predictions. People would be brought to the studio to demonstrate the various disciplines of mediumship, and I would be given the opportunity to demonstrate my mediumship to a live audience in the studio. I was absolutely delighted. This would be a first for British television. I felt honoured that I was to be the first medium to appear regularly working with a studio audience. 